Torah starts first. And the reason why it hits the house is because you spoke Lashon Hara. Okay. What happens next? If it doesn't go away, you have to cut out all those stones. You're literally almost demolishing your house. Mm. Now that's a horrible thing. Whole house you got to pick up? Well, that whole section, you know, and if it's a foundation wall, the whole house will collapse, but if not, it still is a wall, and you're starting to take your house apart. You're breaking your house apart. And a person's home is very special to them. So now, Rashi says, don't be, don't feel so bad, because the non-Jewish people that lived in Canaan, when they heard the Jews were coming, what did they do? They, they, hid, their their they hid their jewelry in the walls. Uh, so yeah. now you think it's the worst day of your life. That's and the Kohen just said to you, you got to break your house down, you got to knock out a whole section of your house. And all of a sudden, you find a million dollars. So now, it's the happiest day of your life. <laughs> this is the problem, though. Okay? This is the problem. How come he had to destroy his house? Why did he have to destroy his house? Because he spoke Lashon Hara. So, you do an Aveira, and you profit. <laughs> profit, <laughs> you find the money. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. <laughs> the Gemara talks about Ein Chote Niskar. You can't do a sin and walk out a winner. Wow. Okay? So the question is, That's if fun. this guy did a horrible sin, Lashon Hara, and because of that, he has now mold growing in his house where he has to knock out a wall, why would Hashem give him a million dollars or ten million dollars? A person could walk away and say, hey, it pays to sin. I'm going to I'm speak Lush and Hara more. <laughs> this Lush and Hara pays great returns. Yeah. Right? It doesn't make sense. Of course, you could also ask the question, every Jew, when they came into Israel, would have started knocking holes in the wall looking for the gold. <laughs> yeah. So it must not have been that common. It must have happened, but not that well, common. Isn't, probably. Right. You know, we just had Holocaust Memorial Day. I once said to you once that if you go through Europe, I've gone through Europe numerous times. One of the things that most cities in Europe don't have are cemeteries anymore. The Jewish cemeteries are gone. Why? 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 That's a good question. I'll tell you the answer to that question. You have Lezhensk has a small little cemetery. In Radha, where the Chofetz Chaim is buried, there's three or four graves, ten graves. Um, in other communities, there are very few except Warsaw. Warsaw has 500,000 graves in the cemetery. The answer was as follows. When the Germans invaded Poland, what did the Jews do? They took their jewelry, their silver, their gold, and they hid it. But they didn't know where to hide it. In the days of Moshe, they hid it in the walls of the house. But they didn't know what was going to happen to their house. But you know what they thought? The Jews thought they would hide it in the cemetery if their grandfather was buried. So they would, they would put it in a little bag and they would dig a hole at the foot of the grave and they hid it in the grave. And Jews all over Europe hid their gold and silver and jewelry in the cemetery in their relative's grave. And they told their kids. When the Germans found out, every time they went into a city and they didn't get any gold or silver, they said, I know where it is, it's in the cemetery. <laughs> So what do they do? They're they went with bulldozers and they dug up the cemetery. So throughout Europe, there are no cemeteries. Wow. Vilna, a big city like Vilna, I think had, had three or four cemeteries, now they have two, and they're small. Maybe there's a hundred graves. Wow. In Ukraine. What? In Ukraine. In Ukraine, for sure they don't Vilna have. Is, oh, what? Vilna is in... Uh, Vilna is Vilna. Yeah. Right. Vilna. You know, there, they, they, there were hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of Jews. My father grew up in a, in a city called Shabrashin in Poland. I went back. I went to the cemetery. Nobody. Nobody. There was, it, was a, it was a grass. It was a park. Wow. There was one or two stones I found. Everything else gone. Wow. That was a cemetery that had 10,000 uh, things. Just look at our cemeteries here. In the last 50 years, 100 years, you go to any cemetery in New York. Thank how you. many graves? Thank you. Tens of thousands. And in Europe? where they had six million, where are they all buried? They're all gone. 
Where are the cemeteries? Don't exist. What happened to them? The Germans dug what it all up. Took the gold the body now. They yeah. dug it up. They dug it up and they buried it over. These are the uh, parks. For a Kohen to go through Europe is a big shaila, wow. because Europe, Eastern Europe, is one big cemetery, wow. where you drive on streets underneath could be bodies. You never know. Never know. Everything mixed up. Gone. Doesn't exist. And even the few cemeteries that are there are small little cemeteries. Small. Compared to how many Jews live there, small. So it raises the question. Here's a guy who speaks Lashon Hara. He gets leprosy on the walls of his house. Now he's got to take his house apart. Boom! He finds a treasure. So the answer that they give is a very interesting answer. This guy was always meant to be a millionaire. Mm. That means Hashem made, decided on Rosh Hashanah that he's going to find the million dollars. Yeah, no way. Right? He was going to find the million dollars. The only thing is, there are different ways Hashem can make you a millionaire. Hashem can make you a millionaire a good way in by buying a piece of property. If prices go up, and you sell it. Yeah. Buying stock in the stock market, it goes up and you sell it. God forbid a person has a fatal accident and he has to sue the insurance company and gets a million dollars. That's no that's no bargain. If a guy is a, a paraplegic <coughs> stuck in a wheelchair because he, he had a car accident, and so now he gets a million dollars, that's no mitzvah. No, if a guy has to break his house apart to find the million dollars, it's not the best way, especially if he gets embarrassed in the community. Now, Rav Palm said something very interesting. Listen to what Rav Palm said. Rav Palm had an observation. He says, here's a guy who lives in this house. In the walls, he doesn't know it, is $10 million of gold and silver and jewelry. Okay? So this guy is in his house. He's broke. Has no money. For, for breakfast, he has a piece of bread. For supper, he has a piece of bread. For lunch, barely a bowl of soup. He is what we call a poor millionaire. He's sitting in a house where in the walls are $10 million. <laughs> but, he's not but he doesn't know about it. So he's a millionaire. Just poor. that nobody told him. He's a poor millionaire. That's what Rav Palm called him. Rav Palm said something fascinating. He says there are many people who are very blessed. And they don't realize they're blessed and they think of themselves as nothing. They're poor millionaires. They're blessed either with a family, with children, with a spouse. They're blessed with a job. There are many people when the, when the crash happened in 2008 lost their jobs, you know? They, they, they have a car. There are many people who don't even have a car. So there are many people who, if they would think about it, are really very fortunate, very lucky but they don't appreciate it. They think they have nothing. They think everybody has more. Those are called poor millionaires. <laughs> and that's tragedy. That's tragic. He says that's no better than the guy who lives in a house that's worth millions and, and uh, doesn't realize the, the millions that are there. The Mesha Chochmah brings down that while leprosy, Tzoraz, is not contagious, but the attitude is contagious. That means you don't want to speak Lashon Hara. No one gets up in the morning and says, you know, today I would really love to speak a lot of Lashon Hara. <laughs> nobody, nobody gets up that way. That, that, that's not how we, we start our morning. Why we speak Lashon Hara is because we hang around the wrong people. So, you know, that's part of why Lashon Hara is contagious. It's contagious because we hang around the, the wrong people. Listen to this. This is a famous story with the Ari. Okay, the Arizal, he was compared to a lion. Now, he had students, Talmidim. You know what they used to call the Talmidim? The Gur. The Gur is a young lion, is a baby lion. So, he was the lion, and his Talmidim were like the baby, the lion. baby lions, his baby lions. In 1572, when the Ari was alive, there was a horrific plague in Israel. 
affected Tveria, Tzfas, the Galil. It was a, an epidemic. And people, men, women, children, made no difference. Many of them were getting sick and they were dying. And people, when there's a plague and diseases are spread one to another, so people avoid crowds. That means if there's a plague going on, you, you, you don't walk next to anybody because if they sneeze, it could fall on you. You don't shake anybody's hand. You, don't, you have no contact with people. You literally isolate yourself because you want to protect yourself against the plague. So the students of the Ari and the Ari, let's say it's a group of 20 people, they began asking, maybe we should stop. We shouldn't get together, and we shouldn't learn, and we shouldn't have a minion, and we shouldn't daven, because if one of us gets sick, all of us will get sick. So the Arizal said, you have nothing to be worried about. As long as there's achtus, there's union, the Malach HaMoves won't, won't come touch us. That's why leprosy does not apply to non-Jews. A non-Jew can speak Lashon Har. Because kol Yisrael adayim zelazeh. We have a responsibility one to another. And I have no right to a Jew. We have something called bin Adam lechavero. Goyim don't have that. They don't have these mitzvahs bin Adam lechavero that they have to treat differently. So therefore there's no leprosy by them. No tzavas by them. Anyway, one Arab Shabbos Two of the students of the Ari got into a fight. Your wife said this, my wife said that, you know, how could your wife talk that way? And all of a sudden they, they got this whole fight. And one of the students of the Ari, Rabbi Chaim Vatal, he said, what are you doing? You're putting us all in danger. He says the Ari was so bothered by this that he got sick on the first day of Av, and five days later, he passed away. And when he died, five other students died with him. So he died, and five Talmudim died. Because two wives of two of the students got into a fight because the you, 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 you brushed the dirt on my porch versus that porch. It made no difference what it was. For years, he was able to protect them from this horrible disease. The first fight that they had, the first quarrel broke out between two wives on the air of Shabbat. It was a minor quarrel. Then the husbands got involved and became worse and worse. By the end of Shabbos, the Arib took ill. And five days later, he died. So it's, it's an amazing thing how careful you have to be when it comes to these things. The Zohar HaKodesh says something unbelievable. He says that when someone has leprosy and gets cured, he has to bring two birds. One bird they slaughter and one bird they send free. Now, it's interesting. The, the, the Medr says that if the bird that you send free comes back to your house, you know what that means? The Tsarasa is going to come back. That means you haven't learned your lesson. Right? One bird you send free, and if it comes back, watch out. That's the next warning. Okay. The Zohar says, why two birds? So he says, one bird to atone to be mechaper for Lashon Hara, for, for talking bad. And one bird to be mechaper to atone for good speech, for talking good. Yeah. What's the reason? <laughs> what? You, did you, ever hear, you hear that Zohar? Yeah. When did you hear that Zohar? I think you said it last week. I don't know if I said it. No. Some Rabbi Mizrahi said it. Rabbi Mizrahi said it. Yeah. So they all ask, I understand you have a bird for Lashon Hara. What about for talking good? So there's a sefer called Shem and Atov. And he says a fascinating thing. Listen to what he says. It's a very interesting, interesting answer. He says, we all know that if I want to hurt somebody, I talk bad about them. If I want to put you down, I can always say, you know, you made supper tonight, the supper was horrible. Or I could say, you think you, you have a job? You don't have a job. Anybody could do your job. You're not that smart. You know, I can, I can put you down. You can cut anybody down. That you need kapara. Everybody understands. But there's something called loshon tov, good speech. A person does a job, works hard, and you come by and you say, that was a good job. 
if you don't say a compliment, that's just as bad as Loshon Hara. That means the Zohar says you need kapara for the bad things you said and for not saying good things. Not saying good things. You know, in, in, by me and Shul, a guy does hagba, right? So when he comes back, I always say to him, that's a good job. He says, why? I said, because you didn't drop the tar. Now I can have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you, thank you, you know. Or if a kid gets an aliyah, I go over and I say, that, you did a good job on that aliyah. That bracha was... A1, you know, you raise the bar. You know, when the Gabbai walks by, I say to the Gabbai, you know, you did a good job today. What did I do? I just stood there. I said, I know, but you stood there so nicely. <laughs> you know? That means, believe it or not, especially with children, especially with kids, there's this idea that you can make someone feel good. It has nothing to do with Lashon Hara. The Zohar says, if you're the type of a person that can tear a person down, you're also the type of a person that many times you could have said a good word and you did it. So you need kapara for two things. For the words you said bad and for not speaking good. That's called Lashon Tov. The Zohar says we need to speak good. When the Meraglim went to spy on Israel, they came back. Today's Yom Atzmut. What did they have to say? Nothing good. If a person goes to Israel and they come back and all they can do is complain, they got a problem. Yeah. They really do. It's so bad. It's so bad. There, I go to Israel. I go once a year to Israel. People say, so did you see this? I never see anything bad. We see that one week we're there. I don't care if we're waiting for a bus. It makes no difference. We would rather just sit on a bench in, in Yerushalayim and just sit there for 10 minutes. We don't care. There's nothing better than that. You know, there's nothing better than that. When someone wants to raise the politics and this, not interested. Not interested. You're in Eretz Yisrael and you're in Eretz HaKedosha. There's nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. Right? That's Only called. Positive. What? Only, Only positive. Already put the four feet in the Now, if you want to know about United Airlines, that's a different story. <laughs> you know, we won't talk about El Al, we'll talk about Delta, we won't talk about these things. Okay. I have some other little things I want to share with you tonight, and then, and then I have to leave because I have a bunch of people mermaids. coming to see me. What? Mermaids. 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 Well, this is a little bit different than mermaids. <laughs> Over the weeks, I've showed you from different Gemaras and Medrashim how things that are in literature, in the non-Jewish literature, we have in the Torah. For example, Tachashim, were unicorns, right? And then we talked about mermaids. Okay. In mythology, I don't know if it's Greek mythology, Roman mythology, but in mythology, there is a group or a city of only women who were very powerful, strong warriors. Do you know what they were called? Amazon women. Very good. How do you know that? You said that before. I told it to you? I told it to you guys? Yeah. Last week. Okay. Well, there were Amazon women. And he brings down over here, he brings down a story that Alexander the Great wanted to conquer this city. And the women said to him that no matter what happens, you're going to lose. If you win, people are going to say Alexander the Great has to fight a bunch of women. He can't fight a real man. And if you lose, they'll say even a woman could kill the great Alexander the Great. So no matter what happens, you lose. <laughs> Both way. Then they bring down from the Seder Hadoros that this was a kingdom of women known as Amazoni. Amazoni from the word aim, mother, and then Zuni means uh, uh, Zion. Zion means that they have uh, weapons. Clay Zion means you have weapons. So they were armed women. And Alexander the Great thought of attacking the city and in the end backed off. And he said, there's no victory here to be gotten. And this city became legendary. Everybody talked about this mighty city of Amazon women that were able to push off an attack from Alexander the Great. Where was the city? It doesn't say. You would think it's down in, in South America where the Amazon River is, but it's not. <laughs> It sounds like it's uh, somewhere in, in Greek mythology. And they talk about this in Greek mythology. 
I told you last week from the Pirkei the Rabbi the Yezer, Omer lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu Eliyo, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Eliyo Anavi, because you said the Jews are not keeping your covenant, your brit, Chayecho, it is by your life, She'ein Yisrael osim brit milah, Asha HaToro Ebeinecho, you have to be present at every brit milah. Because of that, at every brit milah, we set up a chair, and it's called Kisei Shen Eliyo. Or, every Seder, you open up the door for yeah. Elio Anavi. So they ask the question, how can Elio Anavi be at 10,000 Britin? Yeah, in yeah. a given day, or, or on, on Pesach night, how can he be in uh, uh, 200,000 homes? Yeah. Okay. So that is a question that there's not very many answers. So there's a Sefer, Otzer Yad HaChaim, and he says that a Novi, besides being a Maloch, generates Nitzutim, sparks. That's what the Chidot describes it, sparks. What does that mean, sparks? Sparks means little, little, no, little, uh, little things. And he says that, you know, Elio Novi is one of the supporters with Michael and Gabriel of the Merkava of Hashem. But these sparks go all over the world. And they enter your home on Pesach night, and there could be hundreds of thousands of them, and they go and attend every Brit Milah. So it's not that Elio Anovi is there, Myself, yeah. but it's one of his sparks that is there. The Ponim Yofos, the Ponim Yofno, it's a different one. The Zecher Ladovit says that Elio has assistants. He has over 600,000 assistants. And the assistants go to every home Pesach night, and the assistants go to every Brit Milah. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. Okay. Doesn't he have to be there himself? He doesn't have to be there himself. Shluchah Shaladam Kamosa. Sometimes you can send it right now. Listen to this question, okay? You have to understand the question. There was a tremendous posseh, Rav Shlomo Kluger. He wrote the Sefer, Tuv Tam Vadas. It's the, he was like the Ramosha Feinstein of his generation. Listen to the question. You've never had this. I've had this by me. Um, today, let's say a person is in Beit Knesset in Shul, and they have a heart attack. You call Hatzola. Hatzola comes. By the time Hatzola gets there, the person has died. So what do you do? You can move the body. You cannot move the body. The body is Mutsa. Yeah, on Shabbos. On Shabbos. So sometimes Hatzolo will take the body into the ambulance as if to check it out and then drive the ambulance back to the garage and after Shabbat will arrange with the funeral home to pick up the body. Mm-hmm. There's no foul play. There's no problem with the no problem police. Like There's that? no problem. That's what sometimes Hatzolo does. But I had by me in Shul on Yom Kippur where a man wasn't feeling well. And this was before the days of Hatzolah, and they took him upstairs to my office, and he died. He passed away. And they let him stay there until after Yom Kippur. Wow. Okay, and the then after Yom Kippur, the yeah. funeral home came and... The body was spoiled. Well, not in those few hours, you know. It was a few hours. He died on Yom Kippur. But of course, of course... All the Kohanim in the shul had to leave. They couldn't stay in the shul because there was a dead body in the shul. So Rav Shlomo Kluger had the following question. Somebody got sick Shabbat morning in shul, and they took him to one of the side rooms, and he died. So now you have a dead body in the shul. Okay. But after davening that day, they were supposed to have a Brit Milah in the shul. Wow. And who comes to every Brit Milah? Yeah. Eliyahu yeah. Anovi. And Eliyahu Anovi is a Kohen. So now what do you do? Do you take the, the Brit Milah out of the shul? Do you take the dead body out? What do you do? So that was a question to they, they asked for Shlomo Kluge. You can't make this stuff up. Wow. This stuff gets so crazy, you don't know where to turn. You know? <laughs> you know? So the Oats are playing. He brings it down over here. Odo Beit HaKnesset was a synagogue. Shemes Munach Be'ezra Noshim. There was a dead person who had died and was put in the Ezra Noshim in the women's section. I'm not sure why they put him in the women's section, but they, 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 that's what they did. Ha'im Mutter Lado Brit Milah Shama Can you have a Brit Milah on the Beknesset on that Shabbat? 
because Chazal says she Eliyahu Anavi Koenu, and he has to come to every Brit Milah. So he answers, or Shlomo Kluger answers, that it may be true that Elio Anovi was a Kohen, but today Elio Anovi is a Maloch. And Malochim cannot become Tome, and Malochim don't have mitzvahs, so Malochim can attend even in their stories of Elio Anovi going into cemeteries. So that body may bother you and me, but it doesn't bother Elio Anovi. He's got to come to the bris mila anyway, so... No problem. No problem. But it's an interesting answer. It is very interesting. And it's an interesting question. Well, These things, you know, how, when they happen... Okay. When a person has leprosy and now has to become purified, so they have to go to mikvah. But what do they have to do before they go to mikvah? Seven days. They have to, seven days and then They have to shave off all their hair. Right? Everything. All the hair, the peyot, everything, the beard, the coin shaves you completely. All the hair goes off, whatever the reason. Every eyebrows, yeah. every eyebrows everywhere. Eyelashes? Eyelashes everywhere. I don't know about the eyelashes here, I guess the eyebrows. Maybe not the eyelashes. I don't know. Everything. What? With a razor. Straight razor? I guess yeah. it has to be with a razor. Yeah. Yeah. Straight razor. Straight razor. Yeah. Straight razor. Yeah. And, but this is a mitzvah of Tzaras. Right. So up. then the question comes up, if a woman has Tzaras, she has to shave off all her hair also. Wow. So how does the Kohen do that? Woman, <laughs> Cohen is a Cohen supposed to be a proud <laughs> wife of Cohen. Is it? So, yeah. Cohen supposed to shave them? Yeah. Not themselves? No. Because that's the halacha. So he says. <laughs> so the Rambam, the Rambam brings this down. The Rambam says. The Rambam says. The hey choya efshar he's called lachas ayde kohen beisha mitzoras. How can a kohen shave a woman who has saras? Yes. Certain areas. Yes. How can you do that? Upish pashti. I looked all over for an answer, and I found it in a sefer called Ponim Yofos. That it must be. That Aisha's Kohen, a woman who's a Kohen, she's kosher to do some of the work in the Beis Hamidosh. That the Ram is a big Chiddush. That the Kohen's wife, probably, yeah. or teenage daughters who are Kohanim, are like Kohanim. Um. And they can do the work in the Beis Hamidosh. Mm -hmm. And they did certain things in the Beis Hamidosh. And they dealt with these things. Yeah, yeah, so never, it's a very fascinating thing. Never heard, that before. never heard before that the wife of a Kohen or the daughter of a Kohen has the same status as a Kohen, but the answer is she does. You have to treat her. My wife is an Asian, is a Bas Kohen. My, my father was a Kohen. I'm just a lady. She married down. That's what she says. What can I tell you? <laughs> uh, <laughs> We all have to live with these things. Maybe. What? Well, she's still a boss Kohen. Yeah, but she's not a lady. But she's not. A, she is a lady. Every Kohen is a lady. We're all a family of Kohanim and Levim. I have two sons. Both their wives are Bach Kohens. My sister was. Uh, we have only one Yisrael in the family. One son-in-law of mine is Yisrael. So his name is Yisrael. His name is Shner Yisrael. So we call him Shner Yisrael, Yisrael. Because we're all Kohanim and Levi. Yeah. Right, right. We sit around the table. Everybody there is a Kohen or a Levi. There's one guy who's a Yisrael. <laughs> Everybody else. All the children, all the grandchildren, most of them are all Kohanim and Levi. Everybody's Kohanim and Levi. There's one, and, he, and when the in-laws come, they're also Kohanim, you know, when the in-laws come. When we look for a Yisrael, there's nobody in the room. We can't find anyone. He's the most common. Uh, he's, the, he's the common guy. He's the, he's the Yisrael. Nice guy. Okay. In, there's a magazine called Kashrus Currents. I get it in the mail, and it comes in the newspapers. It's from Baltimore, from the Star K. 
Mm. Moshe Haidim, the minute I grew up, I learned in yeshiva in Israel in Baltimore, and Baruch Hashem, I was very fortunate to, to have a good relationship and a close relationship with Rabbi Heinemann. You used to live there? Um, when I was a student, when I was learning there. I never lived there in Canada. Canada. What? In Canada? For a while, for a short time. But I never grew up there. I grew up in Denver. Um, so he has in this week the mitzvah of Shiluach HaKan. Sending away the mother bird. Especially in the springtime, very often you might find a nest on your roof or in your air conditioning your unit yeah. or whatever. Your in your balcony, you might find a nest. Now the truth is, the mitzvah Shluch HaKan is where you find the nest out in the field, mm. not on your on property. Your that means if the person, if the nest is on your balcony, in theory, you own the nest. Right? Nobody can go to your balcony. Nobody can go to your balcony. AC2. What? AC2. AC two. Even yeah. though you may be renting, but it's not Hefker, it's not free. So the, the suggestion is you should make it Hefker. You should say, you know that nest that's on my property? I make it Hefker. I, 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 I renounce ownership. I don't own it. Okay? So that's number one. That's how you get around it. The other problem is you're supposed to have the mother bird on the nest. So the question is, how do you know if it's, which is the bird on the nest, the father or the mother? Yeah. Usually in the afternoon, I think. So, so some people say that if the bird is on the nest, it's the mother. If the bird is standing next to the nest, it's the father. He brings down that most of the mother birds are there in the evening. So you should wait till nighttime and then do Shluch HaKan, because in the daytime you really don't know. It's just a suggestion, but that's what he, he brings down a suggestion. Now, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to chase away the bird, and you pick up the nest, so-called, to show that I could take it if I wanted to, but you don't really touch the birds, and you don't touch the eggs either, because there's very little you can do with those eggs. It has to be a kosher bird. So the eggs are kosher. So now you find this nest, there's three eggs inside. Right? Let's say it's a pigeon. So a pigeon is a kosher bird. They kosher, right? Pigeon or kosher. How so do now, they look like? what? How do they look like? How do Pigeon. pigeons look like? <laughs> Walk outside. A lot of pigeon outside. <laughs> <laughs> gray, gray. Black versus the fire. Gray, gray, white, black. Uh, yeah. Black yeah. might be uh, ravens. I don't know. In the a lot of A lot of pigeons. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The problem is as follows. Let's understand the problem. Even if you were hungry, and even if you wanted the eggs, the halacha says you're allowed to take the eggs. You eat. And, and make yourself an omelet. You know, there's three eggs. You can take the eggs and bring them to your kitchen and make yourself an omelet from blood pigeon blood eggs. Blood if blood goes, what? If you do blood, what are you going to do? Th that's a problem. Yeah. Because the eggs you buy in the store are called battery eggs. They're eggs that are produced yeah. on farms so, yeah, no, where no. there are no roosters. Rooster, yeah. So the eggs are not fertilized. Yeah. But eggs found in a nest it's are good. fertilized. Yeah. Not originally. Yeah. Chances yeah. are, if you open it up, it's going to be full of blood, or there's going to be a half-baked chicken inside, or <laughs> rooster, or, or pigeon inside. Yeah, yeah. So the, the no chance is, if you had a thousand such eggs, 999 of them, if not all Probably. thousand, Probably. so it, it's, a, it's worthless. Sure. Right? You know, you're up. not going to be able to enjoy those like eggs. It's supposed to be what? what? You store it up, you like, no. no, so what I'm saying to you is you don't want to destroy the nest. Yeah. So you chase away the mother bird, you try carefully to pick up the nest without yeah. leaving your scent, and then you put the nest back down and let her come back and take it's care of her children. Yeah, well, so good. some people, they, they, he brings down that they don't make a bracha. It's yeah. a machlok if you make a bracha or not. They, they do have discussions about a bracha. It's a mitzvah. Right. The mitzvah of Shiluach It's supposed to be a wild uh, bird, right? Not, uh, it's supposed to be a kosher bird, not a chicken, that is found in the wild. And that's the problem. So, so he says, when you see a bird building a nest, you should determine if it's kosher or not. If the nest is on private property, you have to make it half care. During the day, it's possible the man is on there, so the female roosts in the evening. Mm -hmm. You should approach the nest quietly. Shh. You should use a stick or something to chase away the mother bird, carefully lift up the nest, or remove the eggs of the chicken, and then put everything back again. 
it says you should try to lift it up as much as 12 inches high. You know, so mm -hmm. it's a mitzvah that is a nice thing to do, but very difficult to do correctly. It's not so simple to do. You know, it's not as simple as people make it out so to if be. you pick up the eggs, yeah, it's good, but if you do that and you leave a scent behind, it's possible the mother bird will reject the children and you're not taking it, and what have you done? It may, not, it may be a mitzvah, but it may not be a nice Proper. thing to do. Proper. Proper. Yeah. Proper. So that's a little bit about Shaduch Khan and it's 9.30. Next week we have Achmed Mos Kedoshim. Thank you. You're welcome.